Good morning, church family. Um, Pastor Scotty is in Costa Rica with, there's 11 folks from, that are from our church that are down there right now ministering to young kids, building classrooms. Um, there should be a picture up there. Can you see them? Uh -huh. Just in case you missed them, yay. It's okay to clap in church. It's all right. Uh -huh. um, who would have thought three years ago when the Lord planted this church that we would be um, traveling to another country to minister to children. We love children, especially children that have been rescued um, from the slave market. And they're working really hard down there. They're finishing the classrooms and stuff, and uh, they're eating very well, I found out. Um, in case you didn't know, your pastor and mine, Scotty, the first night they were down there, uh, he, uh, well, in the restaurant, there was a mechanical bull. Oh. Okay, yeah. Um, yes, he did get on the bull. Um, that's our pastor, Scotty. So today, uh, Scotty asked me to fill in to a forum today while he is gone. Today is a very special day for um, as Christians. It's a season that we celebrate. The, during these, this season, um, Christians, we like to celebrate the birth of Christ. We celebrate the death of Christ. Why? Because he went to the cross. He defeated, defeated sin. He defeated, defeated death. And then next weekend, we'll celebrate the resurrection of Christ. But today, we celebrate Palm Sunday when Christ is presented as the Passover sacrifice. We celebrate the, his triumphal ent entry and today marks the start of Holy Week, of Passion Week, um, a very special week for us as Christians. Um, before we get started, I want to pray for our Costa Rica team, and I want, uh, I'm going to ask the congregation to pray for uh, a, member, uh, a member of our, our church by the name of uh, Dan Fronzak. He's going to be having surgery here in a couple of weeks. I'm going to ask the congregation to lift him in prayer. We love Dan. If you don't know who he is, he usually comes in the front row right here. He's got a walking stick that's about this tall, and the kids just love him. So let's pray for our Costa Rica team, today's services, and lift up uh, our brother Dan. Father God, we, uh, we do thank you for this day. We pray for um, these messages today, your messages, God. We pray for the team in Costa Rica. We pray that you would bring them home safely this Friday. Um, lifting up, Lord, and um, praying for our brother Dan, Lord, that you would be with the physicians as they operate on him. We pray that you would keep Dan uh, full of energy, keep him encouraged, and bring him back among, among, amongst us, Lord, uh, um, as we love this man like you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So today being Palm Sunday, we are going to, to end up talking about Palm Sunday, but that's not where we're, I want to begin today. Um, what I would like to do is introduce you to some people that were in Jesus's life during this time of him entering into the city of Jerusalem. Um, we're going to learn about a little town, a little village called Bethany, a lot of history in Bethany. Bethany was a little town two miles to the east of Jerusalem, and it's where um, Jesus, when he was teaching in, in Jerusalem and he needed a place to, of, of quiet, peace, refuge, he would leave Jerusalem and hike the two miles up the Mount of Olives and just barely cross over the top of the Mount of Olives is Bethany. And that's where he would stay when he needed rest, when he needed to get away. And he would stay with his friends, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. And uh, so I'm going to ask you to begin by turning to John chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to do a survey of John 11. That's where we're going to start today. But, but first of all, I want, to, uh, I want to introduce you to... A couple of gals, sisters, Mary and Martha, and I will read out of 1030, Luke 10.38. Now, now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. 
and she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was, was distracted with much serving, and she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. Take note during this uh, introduction that Martha is serving, and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. We'll come back to that later. Next, we meet Lazarus of Bethany the brother of Mary and Martha, John chapter 11, verse 1. Um, I don't have time to go through all 57 verses. Scotty said no on the two-hour sermon, so I'm just going to do a survey of this as we go through it. Um, and a survey is where we're just going to pull way back and, and look at Scripture and pick the story out as we move on. So you can follow along in John chapter 11, if you like, um, as we do this survey. Uh, verse 1, Lazarus of Bethany was sick. Verse 3, Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Verse 4, Jesus says, This sickness is not, not unto death, but for the glory of God. Verse 7, Jesus says to, says to his disciples, Let's go to Judea again, to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead. And at this time, um, Jesus is ministering down along the Jordan River, which is about 18 miles from Jerusalem. It's when that uh, Lazarus is dead, and he's going to go raise him from the dead. And why is Lazarus dead? For the glory of God. So the glory of God will, will be revealed in him. So at this time, this is just a couple of weeks before what we call Palm Sunday. That's what I, why I wanted to bring this to your attention so you can be in the story, so you can see what's going on in Jesus' life during this time. So at this time, we're just a few weeks before his triumphal entry, entry Palm Sunday, Jesus and his disciples were in the region of the Jordan River, and from there he makes a special trip back up to Bethany, specifically to raise Lazarus from the dead, all for the glory of God. Jesus made it clear to his disciples in verse 14, John eleven fourteen, 14, that Lazarus is dead. Let us go to him. So they made the journey back to Bethany. Then Martha, we're in verse 20, go down to verse 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. And Jesus said to her, Here brother will rise again. I want you to take note of words like death, rise, rise again, and life. You're going to hear that repeated through this story. Your brother will rise again, Martha said to him. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, this is his fifth I am statement in the Gospel of John. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Did you notice? Die, live, resurrection. There's a reason why John puts all this in here just before he goes in. To Jerusalem. Verse 26, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die, says Jesus. Do you believe this? And she said to him, listen, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. The church family, do you believe this? Death, resurrection, life. Continuing in John 11, our survey then when Mary, verse 32, then when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him. She fell down at his feet, 
saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came saw her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Then he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. John 35, John eleven thirty-five, 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. I want you to take note of that word wept. We're going to be talking about it later. And if you're like me and you have a really hard time memorizing verses, this is a good one to start with. Um, in fact, most of you have it memorized just by me saying it, right? Jesus wept. Uh, not to make light of this, we're going to come back to that word wept towards the middle of this message. So, verse 38, they went to the tomb, and Jesus says to her, Take away the stone, verse 39. Martha lets Jesus know that Lazarus has been dead for four days, and there is a stench. He stinketh. King James Version. He's not mostly dead. He's very dead. Look at verse 40, John eleven forty. 40. Jesus reminds her, he said, Did I not say, Jesus said to her, Did I not say that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees were not happy with Jesus raising Lazarus from the grave. You understand it's taking attention away from them. And they wanted to put Jesus to death, verse 53. Therefore, verse 54, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. And there he remained with his disciples. So Jesus leaves the region of the Jordan, goes 18 miles up to Bethany, raises Lazarus from the dead. The scribes and Pharisees want to kill him, but his time has not yet come. So he heads to the north, goes back down to the east, drops down near the wilderness along the Jordan River and stays there with his disciples until the right time comes. So Jesus and his disciples journey. And verse 55, the Passover of the Jews was near. John chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to read the first 11 verses of John 12, verse 1. Now remember, this is all happening before his triumphal entry, before what we call Palm Sunday, when he victorious, victoriously rides into Jerusalem to defeat sin and death at the cross. John chapter 12, verse 1, Then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Verse 2, there they made Jesus a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus who was one of those who sat at the table with him, with Jesus. 
Can you imagine the conversation? This is the last meal of the day. It's the biggest meal of the day. Um, there's guests at the table. Jesus is the guest of honor. Lazarus, another guest, who, by the way, used to be dead. But I, I try to put myself at, at, at this table, and I'm just like, I would be staring at Lazarus the whole time. It'd be like, what? Talk to me. He was dead. He's quiet. He's just sitting there very quiet. That's another message right there. Hmm. They made him a supper. Verse 2, Martha served. Lazarus is one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary, then Mary, verse 3, took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance. Take note, Martha is serving. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Remember when we first met them? Martha is serving. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Which is the better place? Verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. There's nothing woke about the Bible. It tells it just like it is. You still, you're a thief. And he had the money box. They trusted him. And he used to take what was put in it. He was a thief. He had the money box. Now a great many of the Jews, verse 9, knew that he was there, that Jesus was there in Bethany. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they, that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. By the way, Bible students notice um, forever Lazarus is going to have a comma next to his name. It's going to be Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. It's like it's his middle name. And words that repeat, too. Whom he raised from the dead, whom he raised from the dead, over and over in John 11 and John 12. There's a reason for that. But they, they came, the Jews came from uh, Jerusalem. They want to see Jesus, but they also want to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So it's the Passover is near. There's thousands and tens of thousands of people coming into Jerusalem. They're going into Jerusalem to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing and to talk to the money changers and to pick up their um, offerings, their sacrifices while they're there. And uh, so, the, but the Jews are leaving Jerusalem. They're going against the crowd. They're walking the two miles up to Bethany, over the top, up to Bethany, because they want to see Jesus and they want to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. Verse 10, but the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Um, I, I'm not the smartest person on the block, but common sense would tell me that if Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he's alive, your first thought would be to kill him? Hmm. That doesn't make sense to me. Because on, the ha on account of him, verse 11, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. They're very jealous. Judas Iscariot. Before we move on, we're going to be going to uh, Luke chapter 19 next. But before we, while you guys are finding your way there, I want to, I want to cover a little bit of what we've already talked about in, in John chapters 11 and 12. As I read that to you, 
There were words that repeat. Anytime, Bible students, when you see words that repeat, phrases that repeat, while you're reading the Bible, they're in there for a reason. Pay attention. In the 67 verses that we just surveyed, listen, death is mentioned 13 times, resurrection is mentioned eight times, and life, eternal life, is mentioned five times. Jesus has not even got on that cult yet and entered into Jerusalem when, when we were reading that. Just weeks before his triumphal entry, we have death, resurrection, and life repeated over and over and over again. And just a few hours before the triumphal entry, a supper was held in Jesus' honor. And sitting at the table is Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. <laughs> Resurrection, life, no more death. A couple of key takeaways from John's gospel. When we first met Mary, she was sitting at the feet of J Jesus. Remember Jesus said, Mary has chosen that good part, which is listening to my word, the words of Christ. Mary has chosen that good part. And then listen to this. He says, it will not be taken away from her. What does that mean? God's word is eternal it's always existed it always will exist in the beginning was the word god's word you guys on the front row yeah but listen to this his what what it will not be taken away from her listen to psalm 119 89 forever o, o lord your word is settled in heaven Isaiah 40, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Matthew chapter 24, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, Jesus, will by no means pass away. And in John chapter 12, verse 3, we see Mary again worshiping at the feet of Jesus, the eternal word. Mary chose a path that leads to life, life everlasting, eternal life. What path are you choosing? Are you sitting at the feet of Jesus? Are you listening to his word? Are you distracted with many things? What path are you choosing? Oh, oh my. Another guest sitting at the supper table with Jesus, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha is also mentioned by name. Judas Iscariot, another guest at the table. Mr. Narcissistic Personality Disorder himself sitting at the table. He is the president and CEO at the of the bank of me, myself, and I, it's all about me. So Judas Iscariot sees Mary pouring this very costly oil of spark, spikenard on Jesus, anointing his feet and says, hey, what are you doing? We could have sold that. We could have, we could have clothed the poor. We could have put that money to a good use. Who invited her? What are you doing? But he was a thief, remember? And who, who's, who's his focus on? Is it on the poor? It's on him. Me, me, me. G Judas Iscariot followed Jesus for three years, and he was making a pile of money because he was in, child, in charge of the money box. And he could care less about Jesus, could care less, just used him to make money. Judas was focused on things that are passing, things that are temporary. He was self-focused, and it all ended in death in a big way. He worshipped money. He worshipped 
and his God, small letter G, was money. What are you worshiping today? Do you have any idols in your life today? What are you worshiping? Judas chose a path that leads to death, separated from God forever. Church family, what path are you choosing on this day? Luke chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. Then when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. This is the day before his triumphal entry. This is when the supper happened, when he was a guest of honor at supper. This is the day before, and it came to pass, verse 29, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples. And now... It's the day of his entry into Jerusalem. He sent two of his disciples. Let's read verses 30 through 36. Saying, go to the village opposite you, whereas when you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. They did, then they brought him to Jesus. They threw their own clothes on the colt. And they set Jesus on him, and as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Um, Matthew mentions both the donkey and the colt, the donkey, the mare. Mark, Matthew, and John mention the branches that are being cut and laid on the road, the palm branches. That's where we get the tradition of Palm Sunday. And there was plenty of palm branches on the Mount of Olives during that time. And the palm branches symbolized joy and salvation. The king is coming. But listen to this. And it even pictures a future royal tribute to Christ in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. In the future... Listen to this, Revelation 7, 9. <clears throat> After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen? In the future. And Bible students take note. When, uh, when God instituted the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, The Passover lamb was to be selected or presented on the 10th of Nisan. Jesus, our Passover lamb, was selected or presented on the 10th of Nisan when he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as the people cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the 10th of Nisan as foretold in Nehemiah. Uh, I love it when these stories of the Bible uh, come to life and when the Bible interprets the Bible and, and when we see things like this and um, Isaiah written 700 years before his birth talks about him steadfastly setting his face towards Jerusalem in Luke 951, I'm going to Jerusalem, 
nothing is going to stop me. I'm not going to be distracted. Move out of the way. I'm going to Jerusalem. 700 years before was foretold by the prophet Isaiah. Um, continuing in, in Luke 19.37. Are we down there already? 1937, Luke 19. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives. Mark's account mentions the crowds that are going before Jesus and after Jesus. So Jesus is on the colt. There's thousands of people ahead of him. There's thousands of people behind him. Palm branches are waving. What a visual that is. Crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, those pesky Pharisees, they always got to come into the scene. Here we go, verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They can't stand that all these people are singing hallelujah to Jesus. Tell them to be quiet. Verse 40. Verse 40, Jesus says, he's answered and said to him after they told him, tell your Rebuke your disciples. Jesus says, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. There's a better probability of these stones singing and dancing than there is of these multitudes keeping silent. Although scripture often speaks of inanimate objects praising God, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 11 for the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the timbers will answer it. In other words, they're telling Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus is saying, that ain't going to happen. Hmm. Finally, we're getting to the end. This is the part I don't want you to miss. Pay attention. Finally, all that to set up the next four verses. Verse 41. Now, as he drew near, like I mentioned, Luke 9, 51, when he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem like a flint, no distraction, the journey is over. <laughs> he saw the city from his vantage point up on the Mount of Olives as they left Bethany, Bethphage. They're coming up over the top of the Mount of Olives. Finally, he could see Jerusalem. He could see into the city of Jerusalem. The gates are, are 100 feet high, but he's, he's up on the Mount of Olives, and he can see in there. He can see the city. He can see all the people. The temple with all the gold, all of its glory, the, the, the rocks, the stones the carvings, the wood beams, gold, everything's covered with gold. Thousands and thousands of people. The road in front of him and the road behind him filled with people. That journey from 951 in Luke uh -huh. has come to fruition. Okay, I'm gonna slow down for one second. Because um, I don't want you to miss this. This is when you want to wake up the person next to you and tell them you don't want to miss this. Okay, here we go. Is it hot in here or is it just me? Okay. The way we adjust the heat here is by opening the doors outside. The, don't, that's another story. <clears throat> Listen very close. At the funeral of Lazarus, remember in John 11.35, when Jesus wept? Do you remember that? Jesus wept. 
That is the Greek word dakruo. Dakruo. D-A-K-R-U-O. In the Greek, the meaning is to shed a tear. It's under control. Your eyes are filling up with tears. To cry silently. Jesus wept. Um, if I can get through this, I have an illustration for you guys. Perfect illustration of this. On, on Tuesday of this week, I got a call, phone call from my sweet daughter-in-law, Marissa. Papa, are you home? Yeah, I'm home. You need to come watch Dawson. Cooper needs to go to emergency. Okay, I'm on my way. I fly down the road. I get there. Um, what happened is uh, Cooper's fine, by the way. I want to get that out right now. What happened was uh, it was bath time. Marissa's raising two boys. Ladies, can you relate to that? She's raising two boys, a three and a year and a half. My job is to watch Dawson while Cooper gets put in the ambulance and taken to the hospital. So during that time, I have uh, that cruel. I'm, I'm weeping, but it's under control. I, my eyes are filled with tears. I'm holding Dawson and uh, I'm praying. The fire truck is coming down the road with the lights going like that. That's partly what woke Cooper up because he was disoriented. When he saw the fire engine, he was like, wow. But I wanted to give you that illustration of the different kinds of weeping that we have, okay? So, you know, ladies, you know this. When you get your boys out of the tub and they're dancing on top, on the back of the toilet, woo-hoo, it's just like, get down, you're going to fall, you get it, then he falls. Oh, raising boys, a special gift in heaven for the ladies that have raised boys. The problem is we never grow out of it, do we? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we don't. Okay, here we go. Um, but here in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, when Jesus wept over the city, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. This is a different word than the other word for, for weep. This is the word kalio, K-L-A-I-O, kalio. And it is, there is no stronger word in the Greek language than this one for wailing and crying out loud. It's the top. There's, there's none stronger. If this means to sob, to, to wail aloud, you're inconsolable. And you're not able to be comforted. That's our Lord. That's Jesus. When he sees the city of Jerusalem riding on that colt on Sunday. <laughs> so Jesus sees Jerusalem and starts weeping uncontrollably. Why? Why is he weeping? Is it the cross? No, very good. <laughs> no. Let's look at scripture and back that up. Hebrews 12, 2, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for the joy that was set before him. Mark records, Mark records that when, at the Last Supper, when, when Jesus and the disciples are leaving that upper room and they're walking down the steps, they're going to go down to the Kidron Valley, um, they're going to go across the book, Brook Kidron, up into the Mount of Olives, Jesus is going to be arrested, he's going to be crucified, and they're singing hymns for the joy set before him. Jesus was not weeping for himself. This. 
He was weeping for his unending desire for the peace of Jerusalem. He was weeping with Jeremiah and all the prophets who loved the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace. He was weeping because he had full knowledge of the destruction coming 37 years later, A.D. 70, when not one stone remains that won't be thrown down on that beautiful temple. And those stones are there today. Susan and I saw them a year ago. You can actually walk up to these stones. You can walk up to them and touch them. You can stand back and you can see the temple mount. You can see the platform 100 feet in the air where they pushed these huge stones off of there the size of a Volkswagen, and they bashed into the ground and put a divot a foot and a half deep into the pavement. They're there right now. What I just read to you, the stones are there. Um, he saw that coming. He knew, he knew that was coming. Not one restone, stone will remain that won't be thrown down. But most of all, are you still with me? <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. Most of all, he wept for the people of Jerusalem. The very people who willfully rejected him would all be destroyed. These same, pe they, these same people that are singing, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, within a week are going to be yelling, crucify him. He sees that. He knows. He knows their hearts. Their heart's not in the right place. Crucify him. There is no greater sin than rejecting Jesus. Hmm. Oh, my. I would ask that you get that visual back in your minds as we finish these verses. The Lord Jesus Christ is wailing aloud, not able to be comforted. <clears throat> Verse 42, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. You should have known. Jesus is saying, you should have known as, as he's drenched with tears. You should have known. You should have known that all things, this is Luke 24, Jesus talking. You should have known that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. The Old Testament is all about Christ. You should have known that. John 5, 46, for if you believe, this is Jesus, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. If you do not believe his writings, how are you going to believe my words? And listen to Jesus in John chapter 8, 43, why do you not understand my speech? <laughs> you should have known. I sent prophets to you, you tortured them, you stoned them, you killed them, you sawed them in two. How does that relate to us today? The Bible, <laughs> it's in your lap. I hope it is. The preachers like, like Scotty, Rick, teaching you the word, I sent all these folks to you. Listen, listen to the word of God. Back to verse 42, you did not know the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. I don't want to ever hear those words from my Lord. Oh, my goodness. Ah, but now they are hidden from your eyes. You are spiritually blind. You have eyes you, to see. You can see people around you. You can read. You can see everything. But spiritually, in your heart, you are blind, you cannot see. 
2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15 talks about a veil that lies on your heart. Well, I don't want a veil on my heart. I want to be able to know what's going on. We'll read the next verse. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 3.16, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, and now you have spiritual eyes to see. Is it really that easy? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. And verses 43 and 44 talk about total destruction. We didn't read it tonight. Well, this morning. Well, it's going to be night when I'm done, but we didn't read it today. And then Luke 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 27, the parable of the minas, it says something just absolutely terrifying in that story. It is a parable. But Jesus is, Jesus is saying, bring those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them right here before me. You don't want to reject Jesus Christ. Why? Because they rejected him. They did not know the time of their, of their visitation. And church family, do you understand the time of your vis visitation? Do you understand the times we are in today? I don't need to go into detail. Do you remember four years ago? Where did you, where did you go celebrate Easter four years ago this, this next weekend? Nowhere. All the churches were closed across the world, most of them. You could still go to the liquor store, but the churches were all closed. Those are the times we live in. Pastor Scotty and our crew from Out West Bible Church, as we speak right now, by the way, we're on the tame, same time zone, so they're eating lunch down there. But as we speak, they are down there ministering, oh my to young kids who have been rescued out of the sex slave market. It's worldwide these things are happening, worldwide. Do you understand the times we are in today? Kids in this country are being mutilated. <laughs> Ugh. The, where, where they could get a sex change operation, but you don't have to tell mom and dad. Are you kidding me? 2024. You need to know the times that we live in. Pay attention. Jews are being hated all around the world right now. And Scotty says it all the time, and I'll repeat it. If you hate the Jewish people, you are not a Christian. God is, and Scotty says this too, I love the way he says this. God is not going to save the Jews because they are good. He's going to save them because he is good. Amen? Son. Sure. I could go on and on, uh, but I can't. The Bible says that it will be like this in the last days. And you know what encourages me? Is uh, even the unbelievers, the people that don't go to church, people that don't read their Bibles, they don't know any of this stuff we're talking about, even they, I'm hearing them say, they are saying, this isn't right. This is different. Something's wrong. It's not about getting the right person in the White House. Okay, let's don't go there. It's not about that. You're looking at the wrong kingdom if you're looking at that. But they're saying, this is different, folks. Can you tell something is very different? Two months from now, we're going to have the pride whatever for a month. Our veterans get one day. Okay, I need to repent. And settle down a little bit. I love, I love, I love this. I love the stories of the Bible. It is dark. It's spiritual war warfare. But God is sovereign. Um, I had about five more minutes in this message. The notes that I. Sh <laughs> that I shared with you today. They were uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures. They were my own notes. Um, but right now, I want to borrow from another pastor, another pastor, Steve. 
You can't have too many Steves in your life. Scotty says we're a dime a dozen, but he he doesn't know. But a pastor, Steve Lawson, whom I really trust, I heard him present this gospel message one time, and it uh, he nails it. And I wanted to make darn sure that I shared the gospel message with you today. There are people in this room who, who are not yet saved. I want to focus on you guys. I want you to hear very clearly the gospel message. And as I read this, if you can, if you feel compelled to stand at any time during during this uh, during this five minute presentation, um, you're in church. Don't feel awkward about it. Um, but it's very pow- powerful. It's the gospel message. And uh, my question is, do you want hope? <laughs> I need a drink. Excuse me. The gospel message is Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God, sent into this world to be born of a virgin, that he might be sinless, that he might be born under the law, that he would obey the very law that you and I break every day. He is the perfect, sinless Son of God. He is met perfectly all the requirements of a perfect holy God and is ready to give his righteousness to us that we have a perfect standing before God. That he went to the cross, there he was lifted up to die, and there upon that cross the sins of everyone who would believe in him were transferred to him who knew no sin. God put our sins on him that we might be righteous through him. That's the great exchange of the cross. The worst about me laid upon him, the best about him laid upon me. As he shed his blood upon that cross, he reconciled sinful man to a holy God. There is no other way for us to have a relationship with an infinitely holy God except through the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. It was as if he took sinful man in one hand and a holy God in the other hand, and he brought the two of them together through his death, his death on the cross. And by that death, he satisfied the righteous anger of God and appeased his wrath toward all who would believe in him. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It was by that death that Jesus has now provided salvation free to all who would call upon his name. After saying, it is finished, he was taken down from the cross, buried in a rich man's tomb, and on the third day, by all accounts, By all the power that was inherent in him as the Son of God, he raised himself from the dead, came walking out of that tomb, a living, risen, victorious Savior. As he has said this, yeah. As he ascended back to heaven and is now, as we speak, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To call upon the Lord Jesus Christ is to look away from yourself. Look away from your religion. Look away from your denomination, your church membership, and all of your so-called good works. And look exclusively upon the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work. Jesus said, he who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. He loves to save sinners. He is a friend of sinners. He came to seek and save the lost. He came not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. 
Will you tell him this moment what a sinner you are? Will you tell him how sick you are by sin and that you are not able to save yourself? Would you call upon him, Lord Jesus, I am a wretched, hell-bound sinner, but your grace is being offered freely to me today. If you would call upon his name this very moment, he will save you. He will save you today. He will wash away your sins. You will be clean and pure from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. His righteousness is a free gift. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to merit it. He will clothe you with his righteousness. And when God looks at you, he will see the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. And one day when you die, and you will die, he will take you into the very presence of God the Father and present you faultless before the throne of God. Hmm. Today, the gates of paradise have been swung wide open to you. And Jesus, oh man, Jesus says, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. Your friends and family who invited you here today say, come. Come. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off another day. You may never have an opportunity like this again. I beg you, I urge you, if you are not saved, commit your life to Jesus Christ before you leave this room. He will receive you. He will save you. He will wash you clean. And one day, he will take you into heaven where you will spend eternity with him. This is the gospel message. This is the good news of salvation found only in Jesus Christ. I urge you at this moment, as an act of your will to commit to following Jesus Christ. Amen? <sighs> Father God, Lord, we do thank you so much for this day, and I, and I thank you for all those in attendance, Lord, lifting up and praying, especially for those who do not know you yet today. Lord, we pray for the salvation of their souls. Um, we pray for fruit unto eternal life, Father God, that through the power of the hilly, of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would raise up people, Father God, that would come to know you, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and as their Savior. Amen.